I'm Josh Cooperman, and this is Lone Star House of Design, a podcast about all things design and architecture from the great state of Texas. And this week, you're going to hear from Beth Bender, co-founder of the Dove Agency, a strategic planning firm based in Dallas. <laughs> If Beth's name sounds familiar, it is. She moderated a recent panel for Lone Star House of Design, and I invited her back because the work she and her firm does deserves some love. The Dove Agency provides back office support for design professionals, like you. They're good at what they do, and I thought you should hear more about them. This conversation covers all things from this conversation covers all of the topics that keep design professionals up at night. Beth and I explore financial health of a design firm, social media and marketing. Beth explains how she attacks these issues to help their clients achieve by not having to focus on these issues. Thank you for listening to this episode of Lone Star House of Design. Are you subscribing to the podcast? If not, please do. You can get every episode automatically when they're published. You can find Lone Star House of Design and Convo by Design everywhere you find your favorite podcasts. And now you can find us on designnetwork.org, a destination dedicated to podcasts, all things design and architecture. So make sure to check it out. Are you subscribing to the podcast? If not, please do. So you get every episode automatically the moment they're published. You can find Convo by Design everywhere you find your favorite podcasts. And now you can find us on designnetwork.org, a destination dedicated to podcasts, all things design and architecture. So make sure to check it out, designnetwork.org. Look, you and I are old friends. Um, we, I, yeah. I feel I feel like I've known you forever. Absolutely. I, after two conversations, I feel like uh, we we've, we've known each other for a lot longer than, <laughs> than a couple of months. That's for sure. Right. Well, here's here is what I will. Here's how I'm going to preface this whole thing. Here's where I'm going to start. Right. Okay. Um, I have been doing convo by design for this is our eighth year. Um, Lone Star House of Design. I just started uh, this this past year, so we're on. You know, I think we're on episode maybe fifteen or or twenty now. I have worked with a lot of people. I've done literally hundreds of interviews. You know, we're on episode right as of this week. We published episode three eleven. I, I've I've mm-hmm. done a, a lot of interviews. I've worked with a lot of people. I absolutely love working with the Dove Agency. I love- Thank you. I love working with Meredith. Um, What you do, you represent a lot of designers and Mm -hmm. it's, gosh, it's so hard to to do the booking and the publicity side of things. It's a really, really tough job you do. And so I wanted, I'm I'm really excited about having this conversation with you because I wanted to talk about what you do, why you do it and I want you, my hope here too is that you can shed some light for designers, maybe some designers who who are coming, you know, into the business who haven't had a chance to get this professional advice from about publicity and brand development and marketing and financial, you know, all of the things that you do. So with that, and that's a really long intro, and and I apologize, but I I love working with your company. No, and, that's and great. Any, anytime I have a chance to to work with somebody that I enjoy as, as much as I do the Dove Agency, I, I feel like it's really important to, to shed some light on it and give others a, an opportunity to work with you as well. Thank you. I appreciate that. And I appreciate all those kind words a lot. It, it, My- it really does mean a lot. And, you know, we started this, this business and, and knew that um, the only way we were really going to grow it the way we wanted to is if our reputation um, would, would hold up based on the work we did. And so hearing that from you means a lot. So you, you and Kenda started, started the business. Why did you start the business? How did you start the business? And how did you decide that this is where, this is what you wanted to be doing? Absolutely. I think that you know, to start, you know, just with, with Kenda and I's relationship, I mean, we are best friends and 
a lot of people say you can't work with your best friend. And I think we are, um, test that is not true. Um, and I think that when we started working together, it was when kids were young and I was actually doing design work and having a lot of problems um, managing my back office. I was a solopreneur and trying to, to just, you know, wear so many hats and I really found myself struggling. And so I hit rock bottom. Um, one Christmas and just knew I couldn't, I couldn't go on like this for the next year. And so at that time, both of us had kids that were getting ready to be drivers and be more independent. And so I went to Kenda and I just said, Hey, listen, you are a guru of bookkeeping and accounting and all things numbers. And I could really use your help getting um, just my business back in order. And so she came on board and it was really more, <clears throat> I think just a labor of love for her to jump in as my friend and help me <clears throat> get things um, just really organized. And in that process, we found that we loved working together and we loved creating order out of um, just some of the chaos that can happen in an interior design business. And so as we, as we found that we loved doing that together, um, we, we realized that this was something that other designers needed. I had a lot of friends in the industry coming to me saying, can, can you help me? Can you help me do this? Can I, can I have you? And I'd always get a little possessive and say, you're not taking my best friend. You're not taking Kenda. Um, she's, she's, she's kind of my secret, my secret weapon. And so, um, but there was a time when I realized that I think that the joy that I had in the actual design work was really waning. And I was finding a whole lot more joy in working with Kenda and in making this design business run efficiently and, effectively. And so long story short, um, there was one, it was actually middle of the night, to be honest. Um, I'd had a really rough week um, with my design business and it was middle of the night. And I thought I'm not doing what I'm passionate about anymore. And what I really want to do is bring this same structure and the same process to my friends in the industry. So I talked to Kend about it and uh, her first honest reaction was uh, no, <laughs> managing, managing, <laughs> managing you is enough. Um, but I think that, you know, after we really explored the idea and after about, I would say six months of, of just kind of massaging the, the thought and the idea of what would this look like, um, we came to the decision to, to go for it. And so that's really the history behind um, how, we, how we decided to, to, to do this. And um, so we, we spent about a little over a year um, planning, and then I officially closed my uh, design business, and here we are. What year was that? Let's see. That was in 20, we launched in uh, 2018, January of 2018. Okay. So I want to break this down into three categories. Because okay. this, is what, this, is, this is what you do. Um, mm -hmm. I'm going to end with procurement. Okay. We're going to put the, the financial aspect in the middle. Okay. And we're going to start with marketing. Okay, great. Uh, I am so grateful to you. You, you moderated a panel for me, uh, for Lone Star House of Design that's going to be published sh shortly. Uh, and I loved the, the manner in which you took on the moderator role. The moderator role is very interesting. You're kind of like the, the, the ringleader, right? You're, you're in a three ring yep. circus and you're, you're kind of trying to manage and navigate all of these different conversations and, and who could best jump in and where. Exactly. That that's part of the, the the marketing game. With when it comes to designers and and we I think you and I have had this conversation, you know, traditionally mm -hmm. the magazines really did lead the way. And in 2020, up to where we now in, we are now in 2021, uh, publishing has been incredibly challenged their right. entire method of, of doing business. Which has right. forced, which has forced talent designers, architects, to sort of look elsewhere, and it also puts a huge strain on what you do because you have to now look at all of these different avenues for getting your client some love. When it comes Absolutely. to marketing, both external and internal, how how do you work with your clients? What do you recommend they do? How do you how do you set them up for success? 
Absolutely. I think that when we when we look at the idea of marketing, and this goes back to, again, kind of my personal struggles um, when I was um, trying to run my design firm, was there would be a lot of people in my ear trying to take on one aspect of the marketing. Um, and, you know, I didn't feel like I had somebody coming to me saying, let's look at marketing from a business growth perspective versus just a isolated, okay, I'm going to come in as a publicist, or I'm going to come in as a social media manager, or I'm going to come in and help you with graphic design or your website or whatever. Um, I really was looking for somebody to come in and say, those are all important components, but I need somebody to put it all together for, to me, for me and show me how this is actually going to grow my business and, and help my business for what I want. And that's really where we start with our clients. Um, you know, before we do anything with them, we come, we do um, a brand assessment. And I would say that that brand assessment, it's, I would say it's as much brand assessment as it is heart assessment. And that we are really looking when we're talking to our designers about what is the heart of your business and what do you even want? You know, we have some designers that come to us and they say, I don't need any more clients. I don't want any more clients. What I want is for my legacy to be out there and I want it to be remembered. And we have other people that are coming to us saying, I need more clients. I want you to get me as many as I can. And we have other people coming to us saying, I really want to be an influencer, you know, in this market. And I want to be somebody that's, that's really um, out there and seen as an expert. So the way we would approach all three of those um, goals or, or those desires are materially different. Uh, we're, you know, we're never going to go in and have a one size fits all approach. And I think that that's really where we start with our clients is, is what's the heart of your business and what do you want? And once we know that we're able to put together um, a roadmap to, to get them there. Um, we always say that our first job is to get them pitch perfect because we really can't do anything with them until we have their, um, their materials organized until we have their, their, their exterior looking good and really representing who they are. And when we feel like that exterior and that first impression is representative of who they really believe they are and want to be, then we can go out and present them um, for all kinds of opportunities. So does that answer your question? No, yeah, it it absolutely answers the question. And I think to to drill down a little bit more, the idea of the influencer mm -hmm. and what it what it means to be an influencer, I think mm -hmm. is is it's kind of a misnomer, right? Sometimes absolutely. sometimes creators feel like they have to do something different to be a an influencer instead of just mm -hmm. being who they are. So then you you look to the media, which is the which is the megaphone for that creative voice and that influence. I, I hate social media. I I, have, mm -hmm. <laughs> I I rail against it all the time because I feel like social media, and this has kind of been proven out over the years. You know, you can if you're if you're a popular designer, you post something, and you will get you know a ton of emojis and you know. <laughs> <laughs> love you know, you'll get like now there are some clients who say I've gotten clients there are some designers who say I've gotten clients from my social media before but most just say it's something that they feel they have to do and mm -hmm. they don't know why they're doing it so when it comes to what they have to do and why they're doing it uh, do, and you talk about your roadmap do you have a strategy for designers who look at this and say okay here's what I I know what I want how do I get there Absolutely. I think going back to what you said about an, the influencer is really important because I am, I am not in the business of making influencers and nor are anybody that works for me. Um, you know, we're not, we're looking at each person saying, who is your circle that you want to communicate with? And let's make sure that we're communicating effectively with that circle. So um, of people. And, and I think social media is an, a very effective tool in doing that. Um, you know, one of the things that I, I say um, all the time is engagement is probably the most important part of any social media um, roadmap or any social media plan or strategy. Because if you're just pumping content out there day in and day out, um, it's, it's not going to do you really any good. I mean, the only reason to be putting that content out there is if you are targeting it to your circle who you want to see it, and then engaging with that circle. 
Um, and so when we talk about a, a strategy for social media, we look at it as um, a designer's uh, extension to their portfolio. Um, we look at it the same way we would really uh, their website. Um, you know, we're looking at this as, uh, you know, I don't, I don't think you go out there with your social media um, and, and just constantly be reposting what others have out there. Um, you know, you should be able to look at somebody's grid and say, I'm looking at their work. I'm looking at what they want to, sh to share about who they are and then engaging with the people that matter. So I tell our clients all the time, you, if you have a special set of clients that you've been working with consistently over the years and you're going to post, um, or let's say they post their this is an example. They post their Thanksgiving picture with, with them and their family. And they're all sitting around that table that you helped select and that art and those chairs and everything that you helped put that picture together. So they enjoy that family moment going and commenting on that client's post that they put out there, you know, something to the effect of how wonderful to see everybody sitting around enjoying, you know, the, the design that at one point was just on paper and just, just in our, you know, just our heads, whatever. That type of comment is speak far more than getting on your story and just talking to, to air. <laughs> because what happens then is that client says, oh, that moment actually means something to my designer too, because she helped be a part of that. And all of that person's friends see that comment that that designer made. And I, I feel like the engagement is really important part of this. And so we talk to our clients about engagement and what that looks like and how to streamline that so that it doesn't take over your life. And you can dedicate five to 10 minutes to it a day and actually make an impact. Does that, that answer that, that question or? Yeah, no, it makes, it makes perfect sense. So that's kind of the first leg of this is what you do is you know you're putting this roadmap together. You're helping with um, collateral materials, strategy, mm -hmm. brand message, and then when everything's together, then then you move it forward. So on the financial side, I find this really interesting because many of the uh, designers, architects are different, but many of the designers uh -huh. that I've spoken with, they really struggle with the mm -hmm. back office. They really struggle with the finances. Um, trying to figure out how do I turn this expense into a wash? How do I take this mm -hmm. wash and turn it into a profit center? How do I take, you know, something as simple as maybe doing an install myself instead mm -hmm. of, you know, how do I work at the trades? How do I, how do I make the finances more advantageous for my business? Because obviously if you can focus less on what you know there's two things right you have money coming in and money going out and if you right. can manage those two things to make your business more efficient you can bring somebody else in to do the things that you don't want to do right so knowing that what's what's your roadmap when you start working with a new client how do you work with them on their business where do you start mm -hmm. Well, I think the first thing is everything we are doing because we are an integrated um, financial services and marketing firm, everything we're looking at as about the health of the business um, and the ability of the business and making sure that they are set up for success on, on, on either side. Um, so when you talk about the, the financial side, you know, the first thing we find is a lot of designers come to us and they, they think books are order for they, they, they will tell us in those initial meetings, oh, absolutely, I have an accountant, everything is, is up to date and, and reconciled. And when we end up taking over that account, what we realize is, I mean, so we have clients come to us sometimes, they've got six to eight you know, months where they've never had their books reconciled. They've never had their accounts reconciled. They don't know what money has been left on the table that hasn't been billed to clients. And so a lot of times just cleaning that up to start and making sure that all expenses and, and everything flies through that design firm is actually captured and, and recognized and all of the expenses that should be passed along to a client actually are. So just getting our clients clean up um, is, is kind of the first step. And I think we, we find that just that step alone, the designers see their 
they, they see improvement in their finances from day one um, because they're actually getting their time billing on time. They're getting their invoices out on time. They're paying their credit cards off on time. All of those things that tend to lag. So that's the first thing. And then the second thing is that we actually um, reconcile our clients' um, accounts. We go in and we will look through their accounts on a weekly basis instead of a monthly basis. And you know, the first question I get when, when I tell potential clients that is, oh, that's going to be a lot more expensive. And what I tell them is it is a lot easier and a lot actually less time for us to do this weekly than to do this monthly, because there are so many transactions that flow through a design firm on a week to week basis that a lot of times if you wait until the end of the month, a lot of times some of those expenses that designers don't even remember what they were, they'll, they'll say, wait, was that a receiving charge for what or what was that delivery charge for? There's, there's a lot or shipping or whatever. If we're doing it week to week, we're able to quickly ask, here are our open items. What are these? And we get an answer and we can move on to the next week. And the other thing is a lot of these times when you're trying to pull any kind of financial reports to see, you know, if you have an opportunity come down the pipeline for marketing and it's going to be something that's going to cost you some money, you need to be able to go in and quickly know how much money in my account is actually mine and how much of it is earmarked for, um, purchases that have already been made or whatever or deposits or, or the remaining balances of things. And so by doing this, you know, our clients can pull the reports that they need on a day of every week and know this is truly up to date information. And um, I, I, you know, I think that that also helps with the financial health for our firms. And then lastly, just sales tax is, you know, is a huge part of this is making sure that, um, sales tax is always recorded correctly um, and that we're helping them with that process. So those three things, I think, really um, make a big difference early on for our clients. And then as we get that short up, we get we were able to move more into some of the 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 what I like to say, the cherry on top, which is the financial consulting, the helping guide them on truly how much should you be spending on marketing? How much should be spending on a potential next employee? Do you have the funds to go to High Point or to go to Paris or whatever and be able to really look at some of those things and help guide them on, on growing their business and, and being fiscally responsible? How do you manage the kickback? Because inevitably change is hard. And I have noticed, especially working with incredibly creative people, they do not like change and they do not like the things that they do not <laughs> know how to do well. And sometimes that's really hard for high-performing individuals is to say, listen, I know you don't get this part of it, but you, you've got to cooperate. How do you manage the kickback? First of all, we, we, we say this often to, to our clients that they are creative geniuses. I mean, they are brilliant business people. And I think a lot of people will say to me, oh, designers are so bad at business. And I'm so, I bet they're so happy to have you. And I said, actually, you have it completely wrong. Um, designers are brilliant business people and have figured out a way to build their business to the point where they, they get to a point where they want us um, pretty much on their own. I mean, it is, it is they're, they are hustlers to get out there and do what they do and to wear as many hats as they do um, to build that, that business um, to, to where it is when they, when they first a- approach us. So, they're brilliant business people. And, and I think when I start with that approach, um, it, the kickback is a lot less <laughs> severe because I'm able to, to help them understand that I, first of all, I was in their same boat and this isn't about, can they do it? It's, do they have the time to do it? And understanding that if they will work within our system and partner with us, that they will see benefits, um, but it is a partnership. And I will be honest, we've had people come in and they loved the concept of what we were offering. And it was the take it all, handle it all. But then that partnership wasn't there. And they, they weren't willing to look at, you know, weekly, those, those open items. They weren't willing to um, provide us the information we needed to do an effective job for them. And they, it wasn't a good fit for our firm. And so we are not for everybody and we understand that. And if a, cli- if a client giving us a lot of kickback and doesn't want to um, integrate into the system that we've put together, that's not a bad thing. It just means they're not our ideal client. And I'm sure that they experience, and I say the times when we've had to part ways with clients, they've experienced that in their business too. 
where they've had clients where they've wanted to go in and do the design work and the client is pushing back <laughs> and they've said to say, you're just not my ideal client. There's nothing wrong with that. It's just, we, 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 after, after a couple of years, we quickly realized that the partnership side of things was really important. The last element in this really is the, the procurement side. And I think that that's really mm-hmm. kind of the most fascinating part of the business mm-hmm. too. Mm-hmm. There are so many moving parts. There's right. so much, there's so much detail. Um, wh- where, where do you start? And more specifically, most specifically is, you know, how do you drill down on a client by client basis to really find the opportunities? Right. Well, procurement really should be a profit center. And that's the first thing um, in, in talking to our potential clients about where we should be going with it. Um, a lot of people come to us and they have, they'll, they'll have their design fees or their hourly fee, but they don't take into account all the time that they spend ordering, tracking, expediting, following up on damage claims. They don't, they don't recognize all of that time. And, you know, I think there's a, there's a misunderstanding too, that it would almost be wrong to charge the client for that. And that's, that's the first hurdle I have to overcome when I'm talking to people is no, that's actually what these, what these clients are paying you for. It's not just your design expertise and your intelligence on, on how to put this room together or how to put this home together, but it's also your understanding of what it takes to actually implement that design and get that design from start to finish. And so all of that time needs to be recognized and it needs to be charged for. So as soon as we, you know, get to that point where we stand procurement is, should be a profit center for you. Then we're able to put together kind of the process that's going to work best for that firm. And we are, I mean, we do take a boutique approach. Every client is different. Um, You know, we have some clients that say, listen, I, I'm at a point now where I want to do my own ordering but I want you guys to pick it up at tracking, expediting, and um, uh, dealing with the damage claims. We have some clients that say, I want you to do all the ordering and then let my in-house team do the tracking and expediting. So we have a, uh, we kind of start with the vision of responsibility grid that has every single step needed from the moment a client accepts an item all the way through to that item is in somebody's home or, or in an office. And we're going to go in and we're going to decide who takes what role for every single step along the way. And by doing that, we're able to make sure we're not stepping on each other's toes um, and, and effectively move, move items through the process and be that, um, be that support for them the way they need us to, to be. So, but I think the other thing that makes us a little bit different on the procurement side is there's a lot of firms that are, I think, doing um, great work by being a clearinghouse for orders. Um, they're they're uh, doing all the ordering under their business D, which we do not do. Um, we never do any of our ordering under the dev agency. So when we're representing a client, we're always representing that client as, as again, a silent um, behind the scenes partner to them. Um, so the, the orders are being placed as that design firm and the end uh, vendor or, or consumer, they don't know that we're actually the dev agency. Our, our procurement people are representing themselves as a, a assistant to the, to the design firm. You know, it always, it always surprises me uh, because I, I talk to designers who have a real problem with this. And I think the problem mm-hmm. is, is, is really twofold. You have again, back to social media, where a client will see something on Pinterest or Instagram and say, oh, I love this. And then they'll send their designer in that direction. The designer using their creative Mm -hmm. superpowers will say, okay, you know what? This product is one thing, but here's something else that I think works really great. Then the client learns, and it's, it's human nature. So it's not, it just is what it is. The client Mm -hmm. will say, oh, it's beautiful. I love it. Then the first thing they will do is start shopping the designer. And yeah. that is a, it's a huge issue. And I think 
it has driven the, the profit margin down for designers and clients will say, well, that's great because, you know, I'm just, why should you get money off this? Or why should you be making money off that? It's like, when you buy a car, there's, you know, there's mm-hmm. hundreds and hundreds of parts that go into every vehicle. There was a designer that designed it. There's a, there's a, a dealership that sells it. There are ma- people that put it together by hand and machines that had to be built. To pr- there's all kinds of infrastructure created to, to build a car, but nobody right. will ever say, well, why are you getting this when if, you know, I could buy the sum of, you know, that hundred thousand dollar car, I could buy the sum of the parts for $8,000. Well, maybe right. you could, but right. then you'd have to you'd have to build it yourself. You'd have to put it together yourself. You'd have to find it, do the R and D. And I think that that's one of the the major disconnects in the yep. pricing system and the, exactly. and the and the profit center system. And and designers do have to at some point say, look, you know, you have to pay for my talent. It, you're not just paying for me to to come over. You're not paying me by the hour to come over and inst- move a sofa. I'm not a mover. You know, I'm right. <laughs> I'm a designer. Exactly. Exactly. And I think that that's the, the designers when, when they effectively communicate and, and this is something we help with too, is how do you effectively communicate to, to your client that the process of getting the design from paper to actually implementing it and having it realized on the, on the back end, that process is something that these designers have years of experience making sure that the process goes smooth. And if, if a end consumer wants to just go and purchase everything online and, and you know, take the money, they have no idea what they're getting into. They have no idea how to time it, how to stage the items to come in on, on you know, on a schedule to drive the expediting to an installation day and to deal with damage claims. They don't have any pull with a vendor if something goes wrong, um, whereas these designers do. You know, I mean, that's, that's something else. These designers that have been working in the industry and built these relationships with these vendors, these vendors care about that relationship. And so if something goes wrong, most vendors are going to work with the designers to make it right. And the end consumer doesn't understand how much of that actually goes on um, you know, I know as we're doing procurement on behalf of our designers, the number of things that come in damaged, I mean, every designer will talk about this, but I don't think an end consumer can ever really appreciate how much time is spent in dealing with problems. And so that is a process that I think if explained on the front end and put into the contract in a way that it's not even a question that that is something that they're going to be paying for. And that, that that is, again, something that is based off of years of experience and that the end can, you know, the, the client is getting the benefit of that. They're getting the benefit of those years of experience on, on how to deal with those things. So um, I think it's really important that that, that, that be a, a, a profit center for designers, like you said, especially with um, how much, how much everything is changing nowadays um, with, with people being able to see it on, see pricing online um, you know, designers can't go do what they used to do, or it's like, I'm going to charge you retail for this. And that those days are, those days are, are I'm not going to say gone, but it's very difficult, I think, for a designer to do that nowadays. And so they have to figure out, well, where, where do I charge? Where do I, where do I um, make my money? And that kind of takes us full circle back to the very beginning. Mm-hmm. And I, yes. I really look, Beth, I really do appreciate the time. I, it, it's funny too, because I, I can, you know, I'm an editor. I'm not an influencer. I, I'm, mm-hmm. I'm an editor. And part of being an mm-hmm. editor is, is curating and finding really remarkable stories and really interesting aspects to the business. And I have had your clients on the show. Your clients are always prepared. Um, they are very, very smart individuals. And that says something, you know, when, when you have all of, you know, all of your clients kind of know the drill and they know what they're supposed to be doing and that that eyes forward. um, Mm -hmm. It's important, especially now because we're at the precipice. Mm -hmm. We're in, actually we're in the midst of a a renaissance in design and architecture. 
And there are Absolutely. some amazing things happening and designers are very, very busy. And right now is when they need to start getting their ducks in a row because it's only going to get busier for them. And the smart ones are going to be able to do very, very well in this new environment. Absolutely. And I think that, you know, back to, to what you, what you said about um, the people that you've interviewed and, and our clients that you've worked with, they've said the same thing to us about you um, that working with you was, was such a positive experience. And uh, I think that, you know, the best thing we can do for our clients is put them um, forward into situations where they can shine. And you definitely have a way of making people shine. And so we, we just appreciate it so much. Very kind of you to say, and thank you. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, Beth, uh, thank you for doing this. Thank you for moderating that that panel for, for me. I cannot wait to publish it. Oh, that was so fun. I loved it. it. Yeah, you did great. You did great. So I can't fun. wait to publish it. Was, it. And, it was, it was and, a great group. It was, and you did a great job, and you did a great job today. Thank you for the time. Thanks so much, Josh. I appreciate it. Thank you, Beth. Much appreciated. Thank you, Walker Zanger and Thermosol, for your support, and thank you for subscribing and downloading the show. And if you're not already, please subscribe so you can catch every episode of Lone Star House of Design and Convo by Design the moment they're published. You can also ask your smart speaker to play Convo by Design. And if you really want more, follow along. ConvoByDesign.com and ConvoByDesign with an X on Instagram. For show inquiries, sponsorship, and guest inquiries, email me. ConvoByDesign at Outlook.com. Be well. And until next week, keep creating. Keep creating.